hey you guys welcome back so in today's video what we're going to be doing is doing a review on chapter five infection control and i will be working out of the my lady standard foundations book and i already have a video out going over this entire chapter again infection control as you guys know this is a very important chapter a chapter that you cannot only go over once or even twice. You have to go over this information multiple times in order for you to really understand. Please know that you are going to be asked a lot of questions over infection control um, for your state board exam. Not just that, but this is very important information to practice safely in the industry. So again, if you are reviewing or just simply want to kind of freshen up um, some of this information to see how much you remember, how much you know, you can continue watching. All right, so chapter five, infection control, it starts on page 95. Now, you guys have already watched the original video going over and me reading this information to you guys, which I know is kind of long and boring, but again, it's very, very important that you guys review it on your own as well. So today, the purpose of today is to go over some of these topics and also go over some of those exam review questions in the back of your theory workbook, okay? For some of those questions, I will give you guys the page of where you guys can also find the answers. So always make sure that you have a pen with you so that you guys can write all of this down okay now soon you guys will receive a laws and rule book in the mail from tdlr okay texas department of licensing and regulations again this is for texas when that comes in you guys do not throw that book away that book is very important and there's a lot of information on there as well over infection control so you want to make sure that you save it okay so again um let's go to let's see page 97 let's go to page 97 so at the very top it says federal agencies and again all of this information should already be highlighted again in the previous video I have little stars on, you know, some of the paragraphs. When you guys see that is me kind of like hinting you that that, um, that will help you answer your test questions. So if you guys caught on to that, then you know what's up. But again, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, okay? It was created as part of the U.S. Department of Labor to regulate and enforce safety and health standards to protect employees in the workplace. If you've ever worked anywhere, then you are familiar with OSHA, okay? So that shouldn't be anything new. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency, what they do is that they register all types of disinfectants sold and used in the United States. So that should be highlighted and put a star next to it. Disinfectants, you guys, are chemical products that destroy most bacteria, okay, excluding spores, but of course it does kill uh, fungi, viruses on surfaces. It is against federal law to use any disinfecting products in a way contrary to the indicated, to what's indicated on the label pretty much, right? Before manufacturers can sell a product for disinfecting surfaces, tools, and implements or equipment, they must obtain a EPA registration number, okay? And that is usually on the label. What we usually use is this one, okay? It's called barbicide, all right? This you do have to mix with water. And as it's mentioning here, it says EPA registration number, and there it is right there at the bottom. Okay, so there it is. And that is what we use here at the school. So pay attention to all of that information. And that is something that is widely used in salons, barbershops, nail shops, everywhere. And so in the school, you guys will see 
bottles like this, okay? And it says EPA uh, disinfectant, that is what it looks like. Now, notice how the color's a little different and that is because it's it's already been mixed with water, okay? It's already been mixed with water. And you wanna follow the instructions as far as the mixing ratios because you wouldn't want to have this too strong, all right? So be aware of that, okay? All right, what else do we have here? Of course, the state regulatory agencies on page 96, they exist to protect beauty professionals and their customers' health and safety during services. State regulatory agencies include licensing agencies, state boards, commissions, and health departments. Regulatory agencies require that everyone working with clients in a salon, spa, or barbershop follow specific procedures, you guys, okay? Enforcement of rules through inspections and investigations of consumer complaints. It's also part of the agency's responsibility. So yeah, TDLR, the state board, will be coming to inspect your salon or spa. Usually it depends, uh, I know for schools, it's about you know, every six months. Uh, for salons, it's definitely for sure once a year. And yeah, they come and inspect your room, your space to make sure that you are up to part, that you are following all the sanitary uh, protocols and that you are not putting anyone at risk of um, infection. So that is why all of this is very important. Also, if anyone was to report you or file a, co a complaint against you, they will come and investigate, okay? Laws and rules and what is the difference, okay? So laws are written by both federal and state legislature to determine the scope of practice, meaning what are you, okay, as an esthetician or as a nail tech or as a cosmetologist, um, what are you allowed to do with your license, okay? That is very important. All of that will also be on your laws and rule book and you must follow it. The regulatory agency of the state board writes the rules and determines how the law must be applied. Rules establish specific standards of conduct and can be changed or updated more frequently, okay? On page 99, it is saying, recognize the principles of infection, okay? Us being, you know, professionals is not just rewarding, but it is a big responsibility, you guys, that we take because, again, one careless action could cause injury or we can spread disease, okay? Which is any abnormal condition of all or part of the body, its systems or its organs and makes the body incapable of carrying on normal functions. If your actions hurt a client or make them ill, you could lose your license or of course ruin the salon or spas or barbershops reputation. Fortunately, preventing the spread of infection, the invasion of body tissue by disease causing pathogens is possible when you actually know proper infection control, right? So I always say it starts here. The way that you are in school will obviously be the way that you are in the salon. So you have to be very clean. You have to know protocols that you have to follow in between each client. You know, these are things that we've always practiced, okay, prior to what's happening in the world. And if you know, you know, okay, what I'm talking about. But it's always been a thing. It's nothing new, okay? But more so now, um, we have to stay on top of it, okay? I know you guys are aware. So there's different modes of transmission. This is on page 99. All pathogens are different in terms of where they, uh, they reside and how they infect humans. Bacteria, viruses, and fungi have different ways of moving from one person to another or from an object to an actual person. So transmission is the process of which pathogens move between individuals and objects. This is how we get sick, you guys. Merely being exposed to pathogens does not make you sick, okay? As your immune system may be able to, you know, put up a good fight. However, transmission is the necessary first step in getting sick. And if you prevent transmission, you obviously will prevent illness, okay? The most common type of transmission in the salon or spa is basically our direct or indirect, that's something that will be in a surface, airborne and by respiratory droplets, okay? So direct transmission is 
what we most commonly think of in terms of getting sick, as it involves the transmission of pathogens through touching, kissing, coughing, sneezing, all of that, right? Talking, for example, shaking hands, and all of that, okay? Then we have indirect transmission at the bottom. It happens through uh, contact with an intermediate contaminated object, such as a razor, an extractor, a nipper, or an environmental surface which um, the pathogens resides, doorknobs, phones, food preparation surfaces, anything like that. So that is considered indirect. And again, that should already be highlighted, okay? Then we have airborne transmission and respiratory droplets are similar in that uh, transmission occurs when the pathogen living in our respiratory tract is expelled, okay, through coughing, sneezing, and again, even talking. The difference between the two is that respiratory droplets are larger particles that do not stay suspended in the air for long. So wearing a properly fitted mask should protect you from these pathogens okay you guys know that right now you are required to wear a mask when you are doing facial treatments again depending on um, the services that you offer you must wear a mask for a facial an example your client is allowed to remove their mask but you have to wear one okay on page 101 at the bottom this is where it starts to talk about preventing transmission and actual infection control Okay, so an infectious disease is caused by pathogenic, which is harmful organisms that enters the body. An infectious disease, however, may or may not be spread from one person to another, depending on the organism and its method of actual transmission. You guys, in this chapter, you will learn how to properly clean and disinfect the tools and equipment you use so that they are safe for you and the use of your clients. Cleaning. Please highlight that. It is a mechanical process where you, you, you are using soap and water or detergent and water to remove all visible debris, okay, from your tools and implements and equipment. So the process of disinfection involves the use of a chemical to destroy most, but not necessarily all harmful microorganisms on environmental surfaces. Disinfection, however, is not effective against bacterial spores, which are bacteria capable of producing a protective coating that allows them to withstand a very harsh environments and to shed the coating when conditions become more favorable to them. So what does that mean, you guys? To properly disinfect something, and you guys already heard me say this, you must properly clean it right described on the book and i thought it was so funny it's like brush it's like just using mouthwash without brushing your teeth it really doesn't work that way so when you are trying to disinfect something properly you must clean it first so that is the first step to properly disinfecting something so we do use soap and water okay and a, a brush to scrub the implement and then you actually use uh, an EPA disinfectant, okay? Now, a lot of these come with what is called a contact time, meaning you have to let the implement sit in the solution for a certain amount of time in order for it to be effective, all right? So if you're just like, okay, spray, 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 three seconds later, you rinse it, eh, it's, that's not really the proper way, okay? So you have to leave it submerged. Sometimes it says anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes. Leaving obviously your implements in the solution for a longer amount of time can cause them to rust, right? So leaving it, um, leaving your implements in there like over the weekend or cause some damage. So just be aware of that, okay? So cleaning and disinfecting on page 102. Cleaning and disinfecting procedures are designed to prevent the spread of infection and disease. At a minimum, disinfectants used in the salon, spa, and barbershops must be bactericidal, which means that they are capable of destroying bacteria, virucidal, capable of destroying viruses, and fungicidal, which are capable of destroying molds and fungi. Please have all those three highlighted. It is very important. At the very bottom of page 102, it is saying be sure to mix these disinfectants according to the instructions and the labels so they are safe and effective remember in some states disinfectants may still need to be effective against tuberculosis 
Um, so check with your state board rules and regulations for compliance information. And on page 103, it is explaining the ratio of how to mix. And I will show you guys how to mix everything in person, okay? Tomorrow, okay, when I see you guys. What else do we have here? Honestly, this whole thing is so, in, so, so, so important. Um, but again, on page 104, where it says identify different types of pathogens, that first paragraph, put a W next to that. That is going to help you on your theory workbook, okay? On page 105, that chart where it says contamination, decontamination, diagnosis, germs, put Ws all the way through the bottom. That is going to help you with your workbook, chapter five, okay? There's some questions and those are pretty much the answers, okay? 105, bacteria are single-celled microorganisms that have both plant and animal characteristics. A microorganism is any organism of a microscopic or submicroscopic size. Some bacteria are harmful while we know that others are harmless, right? Bacteria can exist almost anywhere, you guys, in on the skin, in water, in air, in a decay matter, on environmental surfaces, in body secretions, on our clothes, under the free edge of our nails. That is why it is not recommended, and I'm talking to you estheticians, that you do not have extremely long nails, unfortunately, because you can harbor bacteria under the free edge of your nails, okay? That, and on top of that, doing facials with extremely long nails it's just not it, okay? It's not it. You're going to scratch your client. It, they're not going to like it, and it's going to be uncomfortable, okay? So just something to keep in mind. What else? Again, pathogenic bacteria. We know that it is harmful. Non-pathogenic, meaning it is harmless. Again, all of that can be found on page 106. On page 107, please highlight all this information that it starts to talk about MRSA, again, uh, are among the most common bacteria that affect human and are routinely found in our environment, including on our bodies, although most strains do not make us ill. So staph bacteria can be picked up on doorknobs, countertops, and other surfaces, okay? So, and even in the salon, so be very, very aware, okay? On page 108, Mycobacterium, you guys, it is the name of a large family of bacteria that is often found in soil and water. So in recent years, it has been linked to disfiguring infections associated particularly with pedicure bowls. Because this bacterium may be present in your water supply, it is important to protect your clients by properly disinfecting all implements and bowls. It is also important that you and your clients keep your skin intact and protected. Avoid cracked skin by using lotions frequently, particularly in the winter months. Advise clients not to shave or wax their legs 24 hours prior to a pedicure. Now, I know you're like, Ms. Yadi, why are we going over this? Like, I don't do pedicures. Um, overall, this foundations book is just general information as a whole for whether someone is in the nail industry, hair industry, and of course, skin. So again, that's why you see the word barbershop, nail shop in this book a lot, okay? On page 109 at the top, please highlight the word virus and put a star next to it. A virus, again, it is a microscopic, submicroscopic particle that infects and resides in the cells of a biological organism. A virus is capable of replication only through taking over the host cell reproductive function. Viruses are so small, you guys, that they can be seen only under the most sophisticated and powerful microscope. Okay, they cause common colds and other respiratory infections. Some of the viruses that plague humans are measles, mumps, chicken pox, smallpox, rabies, yellow fever, just to name a few, influenza, and of course, HIV. One difference between viruses and bacteria is that a virus can live and reproduce only by, again, taking over other cells and becoming part of them while well, bacteria can actually live and reproduce on their own, okay? So, very, very important information. In your state board exam, it's hard to 
to know exactly what is it that they're going to ask you. And they may ask you the exact same question in different ways, just to see if you actually understand uh, what you are doing, okay? So again, very, very important. Please do not ignore. Um, again, you guys have already gone over this chapter. I'm just kind of touching on some things here. Fungi, if you don't have that highlighted, please highlight the word fungi, put a star next to it. What else? The most frequent encounter fungal infection resulting from hair services is tinea barbie, okay? Also known as barber's itch. I think I had someone tell me they asked them that on their state exam. A person with tinea barbie uh, may have deep inflamed or non-inflamed non -inflamed patches on the skin on the face or the nape of the neck. So tinea barbie is similar to tinea capitis, okay, which is a fungal infection of, of the scalp characterized by red papules or spots at the opening of the hair follicles. Then we have ringworms, uh, which is a fungal infection of the skin that appears in a circular lesions is another fungus that may contraindicate a beauty service. Okay, and we'll be talking about a whole lot of contraindications, meaning if clients are showing certain symptoms, you know, certain signs of any kind of infection or something that is contagious, like a ringworm, that is called, you know, it's contraindicated, meaning you're not able to service them and you will be saying no, okay? What else do we have? On page uh, 115, Employ the principles of prevention. We're going to skip over to where it says sterilization, which is the process that destroys all microbial life, including spores, can be incorporated but is rarely mandated. Okay, effective sterilization typically requires the use of an autoclave, okay, a piece of equipment that incorporates heat and pressure. For sterilization to be effective, items must be cleaned prior to use of an autoclave, okay? So again, before you think of disinfecting anything, even if you are going to put it inside of an autoclave, you have to always clean the implement first. Again, it's already embedded in you. You should already know this. Um, now let's talk about things that are actually, you're able to disinfect properly. So meaning something that contains spores, something that does not have openings. So you cannot properly disinfect a sponge I always use a sponge as an example, right? So you cannot properly uh, disinfect a sponge. A, something like a sponge has pores and it absorbs. So once you are done with sponges, you have to discard them, you have to throw them away. Now something that is, you're able to disinfect properly would be something like a nipper that on page 115, also an extracting tool, okay? When you do an extractions and you guys know that clients sometimes will bleed, all right? So that is something that you are able to uh, disinfect properly. You're able to disinfect this a table, okay? By spraying it, leaving the spray on there, the solution on for at least 10 minutes and then wiping it down. But first you would, you know, with a towel or paper towel, you would remove all visible debris and dirt off the table first, right? And then you would actually use something like the barbicide, for example, to properly disinfect the table. So things that are like cotton rounds, again, sponges, those are single use items. You cannot disinfect those and then reuse them, okay? Because they have spores, all right? They have openings. So again, step number one, cleaning, all right? It's at the bottom of page 115. It's very repetitive, so I'm not gonna keep saying the same thing, but you have to clean first. Um, obviously, washing your hands, you guys, my God, that is so, so important. Uh, washing your hands properly, okay it is one of the most important actions you can take this is on page 117 at the top to prevent spreading germs from one person to another proper hand washing removes germs from the folds and grooves of the skin and from under the free edge of the nail plate by lifting and rinsing germs and contaminants from the surface of the skin you should wash your hands thoroughly before and after working with each client Follow the hand washing procedures that is in the back of this chapter, okay? Waterless hand sanitizers like antiseptics, germicides formulated to use on skin and are registered and regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So antiseptics generally contain a high volume of alcohol 
and are intended to reduce the number and slow the growth of microbes on the skin. But again, you have to also wash your hands. So don't just think, oh, I am sanitizing my hands. Uh, that's all I need. No, you have to also wash your hands as well, okay? All right, so on page 118, disinfecting. So the second step of infection control is disinfection. Remember that disinfection is the process that eliminates most, but not necessarily all, microorganisms on non-porous surface. This process, however, is not effective against bacterial spores, which is what I just mentioned. In the salon, spa, and barber shop, disinfection is extremely effective in controlling microorganisms on surfaces, such as your shears, clippers, again, multi-use tools, okay? A disinfectant used in the shop must be must carry again an EPA registration number, which ours does, and the label should clearly state the specific organisms the solution is effective against when used according to the manufacturer's product instruction. So yeah, the one that we have is germicidal, fungicide, and viricide. So and it is an anti-rust formula, and that is the barbicide. So again, there's several other disinfectants in the market, you guys. Uh, barbicide um, or hydricide is just the one that I have always used and the one that we have always used here at the school. But just know that they are others. Again, just read the instructions, leave, uh, read the label, and you know, go from there, okay? On page 119, where it says, not all disinfectants have the same concentration. Okay, so be sure to mix the correct proportions according to the instructions on the label. If the label, you guys, do not have the word concentrated on it, the product is already, it's already mixed. So again, the one that we have, you have to mix it. It is not mixed. It's very concentrated, okay? You guys already knew that. You guys already knew that, I'm sure. Household bleach on page 121, please put a star next to that. 5.25% sodium hypochlorite is an effective disinfectant. It has been used extensively in the salon and spas and barbershop for years. Bleach used in the salon or spa or barbershop must be EPA registered as a disinfectant. So chlorine bleach is the only bleach that disinfects. So it is wise to always look for disinfection instructions on the label to ensure that the bleach you are actually using is actually a disinfecting bleach. Bleach is corrosive though, you guys, and can damage metal and plastics, okay? As well as cause skin irritation and of course, eye damage, okay? So, I mean, just because bleach is, can, you know, work as a disinfectant, it wouldn't be something that I would reach for all of the time, okay? Just because it can be very corrosive, like it's stating, okay? To mix a bleach solution, always follow, again, the manufacturer's instructions. Always store the bleach solution away from heat and light. A fresh bleach solution should be mixed every 24 hours. That could be a question on your state board exam, okay? How often is it mixed? Every 24 hours. So you have to mix basically daily, okay? After mixing the bleach solution, date the, con the, date the container and ensure that the solution is not saved from one day to the next, but rather disposed of daily like other disinfectants. Bleach can be irritating to lungs, so be very careful about inhaling the fumes. I already kind of touched on this a little bit. It's on page 123. Um, it's talking about disinfectant tips and safety. Let's see, it's on page 123 where it says, immerse the entire implement in disinfectant if the product label calls for complete immersion. To disinfect large surfaces such as countertops, carefully apply the disinfectant to the clean surface or use a disinfectant spray and allow it to remain moist for 10 minutes, which is what I described. So all of that information is there. It's very important uh, having a disinfecting container. Remember that all of this, they must uh, have lids on them as well. Page 124 is going over cleaning and disinfecting non-porous uh, reusable items. Okay, so these are items that you are able to use more than once on you know different uh, multiple clients now when it comes to cleaning towels linens and capes you guys obviously you do want to wash them make sure that you are laundering them accordingly and that you also use bleach 
when you are washing them, okay? On page 126, where it says, follow standard precautions to protect yourself and your clients. So standard precautions, I have that highlighted with a star next to it. They're guidelines published by the CDC that require the employer and employee to assume that any human blood and body fluid, you guys, are potentially infectious, okay? Because it may not be possible to identify clients with infectious diseases. Whether or not they look sick, strict infection control practices should be used with all clients. In many instances, clients who are just getting sick or are long-term viral carriers are asymptomatic, meaning that they show no signs of infection. So OSHA and the CDC have set safety standards and precautions that protect employees in situations when they could be exposed to bloodborne pathogens. So precautions include proper hand washing, wearing, uh, obviously using gloves, improper handling and disposing of sharp instruments and any other items that may have been contaminated by blood or other body fluids. It is important that specific procedures be followed if blood or body fluid is present. Let me tell you, that right there and the question of how to properly dispose of something that has came in contact with blood is going to be asked on your state board exam. They're gonna ask you that same question maybe three times and they're gonna word it differently, okay? You guys, I am so thankful for a lot of my students. The reason and why I have uh, some feedback is because of them. A lot of them will remember some of the questions, have a lot more to share with you guys, which I will in person, okay? So that way you guys are aware. As we're going through the chapters, uh, I'll say, this was on the test, like, you know, this was on the test and I have a lot of those, so. And just keep all of that in mind. Okay, so on page 128, and after that we'll probably go to the back and the theory workbook so this is something that i do want to go over so um, an exposure incident okay contact with blood or body fluid you should never perform a service on any client who comes in with an open wound a rash or an abrasion however sometimes accidents happen while a service is actually being performed okay an exposure incident please highlight that is contact with non-intact broken skin blood and body fluid or other potentially infectious materials that is in the result of a performance of a worker's duty should the client suffer a cut or abrasion that bleeds you guys during the service please follow the steps outlined in procedure 53 and i'll show you where that is for the client's safety as well as for your own. As a beauty professional, you will likely work with an array of sharp implements and tools. And cutting yourself is a very real possibility. It does happen. If you do suffer a cut and blood is present, you must follow the steps for an exposure incident. Okay, again, it's outlined in procedure 5-4. Many of the steps are similar to a client injury, although attending to yourself should hopefully require fewer soft skills. Okay, so let's go to page 141, okay? So on page 141, it is going over the handling exposure incident client injury, okay? So again, this is, they're using, like a manicure service, I'm assuming, for the example. So you stop the service immediately, okay? Stop the service immediately, put on gloves. You put on gloves, okay? If you were not already wearing gloves for the procedure, right? Face your client and calmly apologize for the incident. If this is obviously something that you did by accident. If it's appropriate, okay, assist your client to the sink Wash the injured area with soap and rinse under running water. This is on page 142 at the top. Pat the injured area dry using a new clean paper towel. Okay. Number six, offer your client antiseptic or an adhesive bandage. Discard of all single-use contaminated objects such as wipes, cotton balls, in a plastic bag 
and then place in a trash bag, deposit sharp disposables in a sharp box, dispose of double bag items and sharps containers as required by the states or local law. In general, all of these items, except the sharps, may go into the regular trash. Then remove all implements from the workstation and then clean and disinfect your workstation surfaces of course, you will then discard your gloves and you will wash your hands thoroughly with warm running water and liquid soap. Rinse and dry your hands. Then properly clean and disinfect the implements. Discard gloves and thoroughly wash your hands with warm running water and liquid soap. Okay, all of that is there. What they're wanting to see here is that all items that you use to clean the client's cut you are putting all of that into a trash bag and then into another bag. So it's double bag. And that is the answer, okay? A bag within a bag, double bag. You guys are actually going to be performing a blood exposure incident service for your state board practical, okay? On a mannequin, it won't be real, okay? So no need to freak out, all right? And the steps are very simple when you start okay you are going to again put your gloves on you're going to grab a gauze you are going to apply pressure to the cut right we're pretending okay you will then clean the cut with a little antiseptic wipe all right and then you will apply a band-aid over it all of the items that you use all the wrapping paper everything will go into a ziploc bag and then into a biohazardous bag the bag will be labeled biohazard and then you will put it into another Ziploc, so two bags, but everything will go into those bags and then into a larger trash bag, okay? So that is pretty much the steps in a nutshell of what you will be doing for that part of your practical exam, okay? And it's the blood exposure incident, and I have several videos you know, explaining all of that in detail, okay? So again, all of that is very important. You guys, do not ignore the glossary. <laughs> do not ignore the glossary are the type that likes to use flashcards i will recommend that you start that now like don't wait until you're almost done with school like something that you can start now and honestly chapter five would be one that i would recommend doing that for just because it is a lot of terminology and that way you can just go back and you already have those you know done and made and i have a lot of flashcards here um if you guys need some okay but yeah don't ignore the glossary you guys all of it is there what is non-porous what is virucidal what is you know quads sodium hypochlorite staphylococci sterilization everything is there so please 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 do not ignore the glossary i already sound like a broken record my goodness um but anyways there's a lot more again if you guys have not watched that video where i actually read everything word for word i suggest you that you guys do that but again today was more so just like a little review over infection control what i want to do for you guys is now go over the theory workbook for chapter five so if you have that i'll give you guys a minute to take that out all right, you guys, so that concludes today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and hopefully it has helped some of you guys out there kind of review and study for this exam. As always, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye, guys.